Hi, everyone. You're very welcome to Science Gallery this evening. Uh, so tonight's event is part of our latest lab in the gallery, which is called Life Logging. Um, some of you might have had a chance to see it on your way here. It explores new ways to track everything from heartbeats to heartache, and that's quite literally it, it does. So tonight, uh, I'm delighted to welcome our two guests. Orla Barry is the presenter of the Green, the Green Room News Talks Weekly Arts and Culture Show, which you can catch on Saturday nights at 9 p.m. and also online on newstalk.ie. Uh, Orla is also a documentary maker and a broadcast journalist with BBC World Service. Uh, Hassan Alahi is an associate professor of art at the University of Maryland, and his work as an artist examines issues of surveillance, citizenship, migration, transport, and borders and frontiers. He's also the most interesting client our travel agents have ever had to work with uh, to get him to speak <laughs> at Science Gallery. So please join me in welcoming Orla and Hassan here tonight. Thank you. I'm just, I'm just, oh my goodness, it's very loud. I'm distracted all the time. Every time I look, I see images of airports and foods and bathrooms and things. Hassan, I know most people here will know a little bit of your story, as Sean alluded to, the, the interesting um, candidate for travel agents. But yeah. can we go back a little bit before September 2012 yes. to Hassan, who was born in Bangladesh? I was born in Bangladesh, yes. yes. And yeah. what age were you when you moved to the US? I was seven, so I was kind of about that tall, maybe somewhere between there and there. And I grew up in uh, New York City, and uh, half in Astoria, Queens, and half in Coney Island, Brooklyn. So really, it's just, uh, so that's really home, and that's what I associate with home. And uh, so growing up in, in that place where literally every other house, I, I, think, I think we had a, on, on our street in Coney Island, I think the, we had a Nicaraguan, uh, it was heavily Nicaraguan because there were two Nicaraguan families. So you know, our next door to us was Native American, then us were Bengalis, and we had a Haitian, then we had a Nicaraguan family, then we had a German Puerto Rican family, and then, I mean, it was kind of like the UN, but yeah. like living on one street. <laughs> Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was amazing growing up in that kind of an environment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think you know, in the New York City public schools, there's something like 130 or 140 languages spoken, uh, which is just amazing. Because I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think I'd even be able to name 140 languages or however many that are spoken there. Well, you can probably uh, speak a few more than uh, most of us tonight, <laughs> I imagine. What a, uh, then when you yeah. started working as an artist, how yeah. many years before 2002 had you started working as an artist? Sure. Or were you traveling a good bit at that point? Yeah, so uh, I, I finished uh, graduate school in 96, and ever since then I've been kind of on the road. You know, you, you, as artists, you, know, you kind of go wherever there's work. And thanks to Sean for inviting me. I'm here tonight, uh, but yeah, I mean, in, in the same way, you get your work out, and mm. so I was traveling a lot, and in 2002, uh, September, I'm sorry, June, June of 2002 is when my life kind of turned upside down, uh, and uh, a lot of, uh, I, I got to experience a very different side of the uh, government system. Uh, you know, when you, when you, and it wasn't by choice. I mean, you just kind of get thrown in the mess, and it's mm. like, how do we, how do we get out of this? Mm. Had you ever been stopped before coming through airports? No. Questioned in any well, obscure way? Well, just you know, the yeah. usual that yeah. uh, that everybody else gets. I mean, mm. I'd get stopped by cops on the on the highway when I'm driving, and you know, the, aside from that, no, nothing out of the uh, unusual. This one was just bizarre. This mm. one was just like, what what's going on? But uh, fortunately, it's it's it all ended okay. So I'm not <laughs> a terrorist, really. I I promise. Uh, <laughs> So bring us then to yeah. the day in the airport. You're flying into Detroit? Yeah, so the, so the flight was, uh, you know, so uh, it was a rather cockamamie route that I was going from this place to that place to that place. So I'm flying into Detroit on uh, June 19th, and uh, that was the time where I get basically taken in. And so, you know, it's one of those things you, you put your passports through and you go through passport control. And the guy is just doesn't even like look up. He's just completely just frozen. I have no idea what it said on it. It's probably this flashing light on his screen saying terrorist alert, terrorist alert. And you know, he's probably like hitting the panic button like at the convenience stores underneath. Uh, I have no idea what was going on, but he says something like, uh, follow me please. And walks me through this huge rat maze. And you know, the Detroit airport's pretty large. And I end up in an INS, or immigra Im uh, Immigration and Naturalization Services. Um, uh, you know, detention facility, like a kind of a holding uh, uh, room. And of course... And all he said was, follow me, please, yeah, nothing else. Yeah, and it's kind of awkward because as a U.S. citizen, you don't get taken in by INS. I mean, there's no jurisdiction of one over the other. Uh, so I get there, and I'm in this huge room with all these people from all different parts of the world. Hmm. And 
and it was kind of interesting because I'm trying to start up a conversation with the guards there, and the guards are looking at me like, "What are you doing here? You know, you know, you're not waiting for an interpreter, and you have that, you know, U.S. passport in your hand." He's just as confused as I am, and I'm just trying to like have a conversation with him. And that's when I was approached by an FBI agent, and uh, he took me around the corner, and we went to another room. So basically, the FBI agent's first words were, I expected you, you to be older, mm. which is a very awkward greeting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, that's, they did not cover that in my ESL <laughs> classes when I was seven years old. Uh, but um, in that way, in the, in the same way, uh, so I was like, you know, I, I got no idea what's going on. You mind explaining what's happening? And uh, his response was something to the extent of, you got some explaining to do yourself. Hmm. So we go in, in a room and he's asking me all sorts of questions. So was, you know, state your name, state your address. W where are you coming from? And so I was like, well, I just landed on that plane that just landed from Amsterdam. Where were you before that? Like, you know, it's in, um, I was in uh, uh, change of planes. I had a change of planes in Lisbon. Where were you before that? I was just hanging out on the beach in, in Portugal, in, in Faro. Where are you before that? Mm -hmm. uh, I went to see an exhibition in Germany. Where are you before that? And um, you know, my, I was in Paris, my university has a summer program, and I went to visit them. So of course, you know, he wants to hear like, yeah, I've been hanging around these guys with long beards that are wearing camouflage <laughs> with machine guns and goats and <laughs> stuff. You know, so that's what he wants to hear. And I'm telling him all these friendly Western European countries. And you can just tell he's not getting what he wants. Mm. And, uh, and then, Rather abruptly, he says, where were you September 12th? Like, I don't know. I mean, I can't remember, but I can look it up for you. So and at this point, were there yeah. alarm bells going? I mean, I'm sure there oh, were course, alarm bells yeah. going off I'm anyway, thinking, but what, when someone says September 12th. Yeah, because you, know, you still have no idea what's going on. Oh, actually, you know, where were you before? Where were you before? So one of them was, uh, you know, where were you before? And I said Dakar in Senegal, which is where I'd started the trip. Mm. And he looks at me and goes, where's that? Not that he's testing me on this or anything, but he is, and of course, you know, you can't, uh, at this time I'm thinking there's something has to do with like international terrorism mm -hmm. and I'm some mode of suspect, this is some law enforcement guy across the table from me. Of course, you can't be rude to these guys because, you know, who knows what happens. So, so I go in my academic mode and draw my uh, map of Africa with my fingertip on the table, <laughs> point to the westernmost tip and explain to the significance of Dakar and Senegal and the slave trade to the new world. I'm going to my whole, like, you know, academic speech about, about the significance of Senegal and, uh, and, and West Africa and to the, to the, to the North American continent. And uh, basically, he's like, are they Muslim there? He's like, yeah, about mm. 90, 95% of the population. He goes, what were you doing there? <laughs> it's like, well, I'm an artist. They, you know, and then every two years, there's an exhibition there. And they invited me this year. And I did some projects out there. You know, said, what kind of art do you make? Now, you got to remember, I have a hard enough time explaining this to other artists, mm -hmm. much less FBI agents. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of, I'm, I'm glad that we, we came across that. But yeah, so yeah. at that time, I was just like, what's, what, what's happening? And then that's when the, where were you, September 12th wow. came in. And I was like, I, I have no idea. But uh, you folks remember that old, you remember that old Palm, Palm Pilot, those mm. black and white screens? I mean, now yeah. it's like everybody's got a smartphone. But you know, it's like, it was like, I, but I, can, I have no idea where I was at the 12, but I can look it up for you. And we pulled out the appointment and we read this appointment. That's like from this time to this time, this time to that time. Uh, and we read about six months of my calendar. And that's when you know, he realized that, you know, well, I think anyone that talks to me for more than a minute realizes I'm not exactly a terrorist threat. <laughs> but this one was like, it's like, well, obviously this was some bogus report that came in that an Arab man had fled on September 12th who was hoarding explosives. And that Arab man would be me, by the way. Mm. And never mind, I'm not Arab. Mm. Now, you also yeah. had a storage room that you yeah. were keeping um, That's equipment or of whatever. Of course, you know, because every, everyone that has a storage unit is sketchy. I mean, yeah. you know, why, why else would you need a storage unit? <laughs> So they, <laughs> they knew about this storage unit. That's, that's what they got the report on. So okay. supposedly I had the explosives in that storage unit. Ah. And, of course... And where did this come from, do you know? Do you know how the whole story originated then? I think it was a report. I mean, I think I got reported. Uh, somebody called in. Uh, I kind of have a pretty good idea of who called it in, um, uh, but uh, you know, it's 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 hard to it's hard to prove these types of things. But there's only a handful of people that even know how to storage unit. And, uh, and, and were and, they being malicious? I don't think so. I think they were just being dumb and ignorant. 
Okay. I mean, you know, it's one of those things. It's like I'm sure they're kind of going. You know, you see, you know, you hear all these things. If you see something, say something because you know it's you know it's when it's when it's on the news, it's too late, and you could you should have done something about it. Yeah. You know, it's this it's this entire all those Fox News ads. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's this entire culture of suspicion breeds confidence. You know, it's that type of thing. So you know, it's, it's you know, you, the person sitting next to you could be really sketchy. I mean, you never know. So I mean, they they might be they might be hiding something from you. <laughs> so it's it's that kind of culture. You know, it's yeah. it's that type of thing. So I'm sure they're hearing this on Fox News or wherever, yeah. and they're like, well, who who's that guy that that was there? Who who's that guy? Oh, well, let's let's look up these old records. Oh, wait, wait, he's got one of them funny names. Uh, wait. It's uh, what, what kind of, it's, it's one of the Muslim names. If he's Muslim, then, then you must be Arab. I mean, that's just mm. a given. If you're Muslim, then you're Arab. Never mind, it spans like half the world. Mm. Uh, and then if you're Arab, then you must have explosives. Mm. I mean, that's, that's, logic tells us that, right? I mean, it's, and that, and that is, you know, we laugh about it, but that's the kind of ignorance that we're mm. going on here. Mm. And that's kind of, you know, look, I've accepted the fact that on a daily basis, we're all gonna run into this individually. There's really no, there's really no way around it. That's just part of dealing with daily life. You're going to run into dumb, ignorant people. But when a country, and particularly your own country, takes on that ignorance for the basis for national policy, it's, it's kind of frightening. It's kind of frightening. And that's what, caught me, that, that's what got me caught up in this whole net of, of, uh, of a, really this mess. And How long I, do they keep you in the room that day? It's, it's impossible to keep track of time because you lose time in those types of things. Uh, if I were to guess, I'm guessing between three hours, mm. two, two to three hours. I mean, yeah. And did you ever at any stage say, yeah. can I have a lawyer? I need no, to see my no, lawyer. No, 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 I did not do that at all. Because the thing is, I had enough sense to know that whatever was happening was happening outside of the law. And bringing in a lawyer into this would only aggravate the situation. It's kind of, you know, when you're, when you're sitting face to face with someone across the table from you with essentially the power of life and death. Uh, you do this weird thing where you revert to this very animalistic instinct of survival. And you do whatever you have to do to survive. And in my case, survival meant cooperate. So, and I think had I, brought, had I said, look, I'm not talking until I get a lawyer, there would have been some, some uh, aggravation mm -hmm. that may not have been ideal for me to bring in. And, and it was one of those things, it's like, okay, how do we de de-escalate the the situation mm -hmm. here? It's like you know, it's like you guys know this, I know this. We we both we both got to figure this out. Yeah. And I think one of the things that happens in those kinds of situations is that it. I think it's it's a very animalistic type of a situation, and and you do you know whatever the animal has to do to survive. You get reduced to to your essentially your you know your animal functions. So at, I mean, the end that, yeah. of the, at the end of the three hours then, what do they say? Yeah. Do they say, actually, so, Sam, this has been a mistake. You can go now, up, yeah. off on your way. Well, they didn't exactly say this has been a mistake, but what they did say is, well, we have enough information. We're going to pass this on to the Tampa office. They're the ones that initiated this. And they'll follow up with you, and we'll get this cleared up. So they let me go home. So obviously, I wasn't enough of a threat to, for them to keep me there. So I went back to Tampa, and then... The phone rings a few weeks later, or actually it was maybe a w later on that week, and said, hey, we'd like to do a follow-up to your interview in Detroit. And This is the FBI. This is the FBI, yeah. It's a very different kind of interview than, than, than this type of conversation. I mean, they have very interesting <laughs> vocabulary that they, that they use. Um, and and so, so one of the best parts was, uh, so, so they said, hey, we'll, we'll, we can meet you at your house. We can meet you at your uh, office. We can meet at a public place. We can meet wherever you like. I got nothing to hide. I'll just show up at your office. So we make an appointment, and I'm and I park my big old pickup truck with the shotgun rack on the country music stations because because I, I like that stuff. And I park there around the corner. I'm walking around the building on Zach Street, which is where the federal building in Tampa is. And I get on, and it's this weird thing. You see this guy with two phones, and he's like, "Please wait." And this real awkward distance where maybe like 10 meters or so where. He can watch everything that I'm doing, but it's too difficult, it's too far to actually have a conversation with. And I'm at the side of the sidewalk, and the only thing that's going through my head is some, some you know, van's gonna pull up and I'm gonna get abducted and no one's ever gonna hear from me. <laughs> so he's like back and forth on his phones, and then he puts his phones away and says, you may approach. <laughs> I mean, this, this is the start this of the is, interview. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this again. You know, you know. I think it would help if they get some ling if they got some like mm. training for mm. how to talk to people, mm. <laughs> except each other. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, you know, so I approached, you know, walk into the building. And this is not your typical security guards. These are like federal marshals. This is a federal building. And there's all these guys in there. And then I, I remember there was, there, were, there was this one guy, very particularly, you know, like big round guy. And kind of not really round, but like solid, like no neck kind of guy. And he, he, has to, well, he has to put his arms like this because it won't go any lower. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, this, this, uh, this federal marshal. And uh, very pink, very pink guy. And he starts yelling at me in Arabic. Hmm. I was like, I got no idea what you're saying. And, he, and then he just completely just refuses to acknowledge that I'm speaking to him in English and just continues barking at me in Arabic. It's like, it's like look, I know you speak English. It's like, whatever you want to know, just, just ask me in English. I'll be yeah. more than happy to tell you. But then he just continues barking in Arabic. Mm. And then that's when the guy on the two phones had enough of the circus and says, it's OK, and just walks me through. And uh, so we end up, it was either the fifth floor or the sixth floor. It was either room 516 or 615. Uh, but we get up there, and you know, it's this, this, the federal buildings are just weird. I mean, government buildings, I mean, they have a very unique smell. And it has the smell of bureaucracy. <laughs> and uh, you got these carpeted walls, you got cameras in the corners, and you sit down and there's like a L-shaped desk. One thing I learned is the FBI loves L-shaped wood grain desks. <laughs> you know, that, with that fake formica walnut kind of yeah. wood with the chrome legs. Yeah, they, they love it. I everywhere. Think, yeah, everywhere you look, every room had one. <laughs> I'm thinking they must have gotten a great bulk special on them. But uh, yeah, so yeah, so I spent you know going back and forth with these going guys. Going back and forth. So how, so when yeah. and when you sat in there, did they say again? Look, this is the reason that we brought you in. We had somebody called in. We're a little bit that was confused. Th that would be the summary of it. But mm -hmm. they never actually come out and say this say. is you know this is why we're invested. They just ask. They just start asking. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where they're not in the business of providing information. Mm. Uh, I mean, th all they want from you is information. Mm. And they just they would ask me all sorts of all sorts of bizarre things. Um, you know, one of the questions that they asked me, you know, he's flipping through my passport, and he's like, "Why is it that you've been almost to every enemy state of the United States?" <laughs> and we're talking like places like you know, like China and Vietnam here. <laughs> we're not exactly talking like you know, Iran and Libya. Yeah. Uh, you've made a lot of enemies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like you know, I guess there are a lot of enemies that mm. we have. Mm. So uh, and and actually at yeah. that point you never thought to yourself now's the time for a lawyer because I'm walking into the building mm -mm -mm -mm. and no no, no 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 because because it's all extrajudicial mm. I mean it's all outside the, you know we have this idea that and you know and, and one of the things that growing up in the U S and having this these Bill of Rights and these um, the, the Constitution being ingrained in you since you're a small child about these are your rights. That all goes out the window when it comes to the magic wand of national security and terrorism. I mean, I'm sorry, it just does, it just does not apply. Mm -hmm. And everything happens outside of it. And that's, that's, where, that's what's really scary. And I knew that whatever was happening was happening outside. And, uh, and I knew that if they really wanted to, you know, I could be shipped off to some Caribbean island in an orange jumpsuit. Uh, you know, it's, well, the weather would be good, but the rest of it would be pretty miserable. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I, you know, so that I was really, that was the thing. And how do, how do we prevent it? How do we de-escalate? Mm -hmm. And really the conversation came down to is, what can I do for you? Mm -hmm. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. Which is probably not the usual response that most terrorist suspects would be <laughs> giving the FBI. The no, FBI. It's like, how, long, you know, how long did these sessions continue then? They went on for the next six months. Wow. And it finally ended. Uh, after a series of polygraph examinations where you know, they had all these wires. And of course, the polygraphs aren't really, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not that scientifically accurate, but they still use them. And the guy that, uh, the guy that uh, administered, he told me that this is what he's been doing for decades at the hmm. FBI, and he, he was a polygraph so did have guy. you hooked up to something? Yeah, that goes yeah, they got me hooked up. I got wires coming out, you know. And, it's, and you know, most, I mean, you've seen like movies, and you think of like the, the scratching and yeah. the buzzing. It's none of that. Oh, There's right. none of that. It's basically, a, you know, a boring little computer monitor that he's looking at that makes no noises, except the guy's voice is kind of like a computer. You know, it's like, is today Tuesday? You know, are we in Florida? Is your name Hassan? So you, you need like baseline questions, and then you know, so at the end, he, at the end of the, of the whole thing, he leaves, and then my regular FBI agent comes back. And he says everything's okay. It's like yeah, I know everything's okay. That's what I've been trying to tell you guys all along. And he's like, well yeah, well, you know, you're, you're, you can go. Everything's okay. I was like no 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 wait 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 wait. I travel a lot, and all we need is the last guy not to get the next memo, 
And here we go all over again. How do, how do we avoid this? How do we avoid this from happening again? And at the time, they were actually sincerely concerned. Uh, you know, because my thing is like, look, I'm not really afraid of, oh, actually, so I was supposed to be going to a thing in Indonesia right after that uh, in December, and uh, the Bali bombings were that October. Oof. So he's like, no, 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 you shouldn't go. It's really, really dangerous there. We just had a terrorist attack in Indonesia. If, if, <laughs> you know, after they're in investigating me for like yeah. six months, <laughs> they're telling me to be careful of this. Yeah. I was like, well, you know, my, my, my fear is not necessarily a terrorist attack in Indonesia, but my fear is you guys. Uh, you guys, like something slipping through the cracks, something getting screwed. Because you know, it's one of those, it, the, the system is so large, it can't possibly operate at 100% efficiency. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. I mean, anytime you, have, anytime you have a system that complex, that large, errors will happen, things will slip through the cracks. Mm. Said, guys, what do I do? And at that time, that's when the FBI agent gave me some phone numbers and said, uh, here, get in, if you get into trouble, give us a call. We'll take care of it. So I figured, hey, I got, you know, this, this, is, the best, this is the best security guards in the business. <laughs> and actually, security guards, it's kind of like not appropriate because this is like the elite of the elite of the elite of law enforcement in the U.S. So these guys were like, great. So every time I would go anywhere, I'd call my FBI agent, I'd tell him where I was going, not because I had to, but because I chose to. I would tell him, hey, I'm going on this trip at this hour at this time, and I'm going to be on this flight coming back to this airport, just making sure you guys know. Mm. He said, thank you, passes on to the local guys, and this went on. So the, the phone calls got longer and longer, and, they got the, and then, they, then I would just email him, and then the emails got really long to like thousands of words, and I'd tell him all the great beaches to hang out in Southeast Asia. <laughs> tell him all sorts of like, you know, like, you know, like, well, this was a really good meal, like you know, Frankfurt to Mombasa and things like that. I'd tell him like, you know, hey, I'm over here, or I'm using this toilet on this day. Because you know, he needs to know. I mean, I'm all about full disclosure. So did he all, write back? Would he'd he always say, back? Thank you. Be safe. That's all you had to write. That was it. That was it. That was Fantastic. it. Fantastic. I mean, you know, it's 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 a really, really like screwed up and unbalanced relationship. <laughs> it's like here you are, you think you're really connecting with someone, you're opening your heart out, telling them everything, and they're just like, thank you. This unrequited love. Yeah. And, and was it the yeah. same chap the whole time? Yeah. So I'd always I would send it uh, send him. You know, I mean, that was the guy that worked with me the whole time. And it's like it's like we have a relationship here. I mean, he understands me. I understand him. Uh, so we did this, uh, so yeah, so basically then, then it got to a point where after all those pouring my heart out yeah, and only getting knows, four yeah. words back, uh, I was just like, you know, this is, this is not cool. It's like, why is it that only, why is it that he's so special? Why is it that only he gets to know what I'm doing? So I decided that uh, the way to do this is to basically open up and just do this, communicate publicly. And that's when I created this. Uh, so I guess these days it would be called an app, but you know, 12 years ago the word app just didn't exist in the mm. same way that we use today. And, uh, and back then, I mean, technologically, this was like technological duct tape of this thing attached to that thing with that yeah. thing. You know, because now it's all runs off my iPhone. Uh, and basically, and actually all your phones are probably tracking you way better than, than the software ever could. Uh, and you go in there and you just do all these types of things. And now it's just basically three, three buttons. Yeah, so, yeah, so, you can so see here what we're looking at, is that... Is right here. It's right here. Yeah, that's so. This is you. Yeah. This is you checking in mm -hmm. on the way in, checking in to, yeah. to the science gallery, and then yeah. that's how they have it. So all the time, then wherever yeah. you're going, so do you always you always mm -hmm. click in and check in. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, like it, the the increment of time, I'm totally in control over that. So mm -hmm. it's not that every hour or every two. Hours, it's not. A, it's not a line. It's not a live video feed. And what you're really getting is a point here, a point there, a point there, and a point there. And it's when I felt I've made a change in location, or a significant change in mm -hmm. location. So if, if, I'm, if I'm upstairs doing you know, a thing in, in, in the house, and then I go to the laundry room downstairs, I'm not going to update that. I mean, that's, it doesn't make sense. I mean, there's only so many pictures you'll, you'll, you'll want to see of my cat. But uh, the photo is always up, and then the photo goes with the geotech. And of course, you know, now it seems so primitive because now it's like almost every, every photo that you've take, uh, taken on your phone is now geotagged, and it's so commonplace. Yeah. But 12 years ago, people looked at me like I was crazy. It's like, so 12 know. years ago, you, were, you, you pulled out your camera, you took a picture of the yeah. media, you posted it up onto, the, 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 onto well, your website. Well, there was a GPS that would get the coordinates from there and then yeah. or then I would actually uh, and then there was a part of the code that would look up very so in the old days the way this would work is I would say science gallery Dublin and it would look up science gallery Dublin and it would do a cross list uh, it would it would do a it, it would look up where the uh, where the address of it is mm. and then look up the corresponding 
GPS coordinates. So it was all based off of addressing, and, it's all, and all the heavy lifting was done at the server end. And, you know, and I'm completely self-trained in this. This is not something that, I mean, I'm an artist. I mean, I'm not really a, 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 a computer science person. I mean, I understand enough just to use it. But, uh, so I created this totally from scratch, just out of necessity, and now it's like, you know, so I'm and did obsolete. you inform? Did you inform this FBI agent? Oh, that yeah. Actually, this is where you get yeah, my yeah. details yeah. now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So, so he he would be. I send him. I still send him Christmas cards and stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he never sends them back. Yeah, he does he not? Never sends them back. No. Um, so, so some of the images that we've been looking yeah. at, for example, and yeah. it's it's very hard for those of us who well didn't take the picture to tell where any of this is, mm -hmm. and some of them are dated, some of them aren't. Yeah. They are all, they're all jumbled. They're not, there's no sequence to any of they, this. There actually is. Oh, but, is there? But it's, it's a very user-unfriendly interface. <laughs> I mean, you know, so for, I, know, I know there's a lot of... Uh, Can, do you know where that toilet was? That one looks like, well, that looks like a European toilet. This is November 14th, so I'm assuming this is Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Uh, this is an airport. I, I wish I could tell you the name of the airport off the top of my head, but I'm blanking on this one. Well, that's uh, in Tampa, Florida. I spent $9.84 at 2100 West Swan, which I think was the grocery store. This is Busan Air, uh, Airport. And is this in, all within the last 12 months? No, no, no. This is over the last 12 years. 12 years, okay. So, so one of the things that happens is like you'll see January 27th, and it might show San Jose, California, and then you'll see January 27th, and it'll show like Hong Kong. Well, you have to do the, the, the FBI agent's work and realize they're different years. They're not exactly the same year. And so what you're basically getting is, you know, instead of getting this live stream in this, in this line, you're getting a point here, a point there, a point there, and a point there. And you have to role play. You have to reenact the role of the FBI agent and say, okay, this one with that one, with that one, with that one. So this is Santiago, Chile, for example, at the stadium. I mean, you would never know that by looking at it, but mm -hmm. I just, that's, this is Birmingham, Alabama, mm -hmm. at a, at a uh, homes, Homewood Suites. This is uh, 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 the other airport in Moscow, not, not Chermitivo. Do you uh, know all, the, do you recognize all the photos? I actually, yeah, I recognize quite do a few you? of them, do yeah. You? And one of the things that's happened is that, you know, so for example, this one, uh, this was on the street in, in Jakarta, I'm sorry, in, in Jakarta, in, in Indonesia, and I can tell you who I was with before, who I was with after. It's all these things that are get triggered. And one of the things that's done is I think as we, as we document more of our lives, and I think this is a lot of the premise of the exhibition that you're mm -hmm. seeing over here is this life logging, um, we're externalizing a lot of our memory. I mean, if you think about it, how many phone numbers did you know off the top of your head 15 years ago? Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, I mean, before we all had cell phones, we used to be able to remember hundreds of phone numbers, and now, how many do we know? Two. Yeah, if that, and me, now I don't even have me to... Me and mother. <laughs> yeah, I don't even have to know their number. I just have to just look at their name and just touch their name, and it calls. So I've externalized that part of our... And not just, but many of us have externalized that part of our memory to this device. Mm. And, you know, we've always had... The, and we've, we've all kind of had a similar situation where you're sitting there, and you type in something in your Gmail, looking for a search and an old email pops up from someone that you've completely forgotten about. But, you know, but, but it triggers it's, all of yeah. these other memories. People that are just no longer in your life at all, but then you remember all of these things. And I'm wondering what that means, because as we externalize and as we keep more of our data, the other interesting side, the other flip side to this is data storage has become so cheap that there's no reason to delete. I mean, I don't know what happens to my spam. I mean, it just kind of comes in and Gmail does something with it, but I don't, I don't even delete spam anymore because you know, it's not like we only have two megabytes of hard drive space for our emails anymore. Now it's just, essentially, it might as well be infinite in many ways. So when uh, you, yeah. and, and going back to the, you know, the yeah. whole purpose of this exhibition, when you look at people nowadays mm -hmm. between Facebook and Twitter yeah. and all of that and how people are letting their lives mm -hmm. be out there, is your argument, <laughs> don't worry about your privacy, put everything out there and it well, doesn't really matter. Maybe, maybe not necessarily in those words. Mm -hmm. Maybe not necessarily. I think one of the things is that we really need to look at a, a different definition of what privacy is. And what we used to think of as the normal for privacy in, in a previous generation, I don't think necessarily applies. And I really don't think detaching and, and disconnecting is an option. I mean, look, we're not going to give up our phones. We're not going to give up 
our, you know, our, our ATM machines or, or our uh, electronic payments that we do. We're not going to go back to trading gold for this and that. It's just, it's just not realistic for us mm -hmm. to be in the 21st century and move backwards. I mean, but one of the things that we can do is we can control and shape that. And the way we do that is by deciding what do we want to put out. So in a sense, what I've decided to do is in order to regain my privacy with the FBI, well, with just in general, mm -hmm. and I've decided to make everything open. But in, in making it in completely open, I've decided that I'm going to be very specific about what I said. So when you see this image, I mean, this image really could be anywhere. It literally could be anywhere, or this image right here. But if you've been there, or, or that image that you see of the scrolling on the, on, the, on the right, that really could be any emergency exit with a scaffolding around it. Mm. But for all of us in this room, we know that it can't be anywhere except that corner of the room, this, this photo that you're seeing. It could only be that corner right now. Mm. And so if we have an association with that space and that image, as anonymous and as generic and as boring and bland as that image is, it has value for the people that are associating with it. So in a way, I'm giving you information, but I'm not giving you interpretation. Mm. There are no people There's featured, no. I don't think, in no, any of these. I don't like people. So, you, so, <laughs> so when, you, when you go for lunch with someone, you've taken the picture of yeah. your food. Mm -hmm. Do you ever take a picture of them and post no, that up well, on it? Well, you know, it's actually not about the person. So you'll never see me, you'll never see anyone else. And I mean, you may see a few people that are incidental to the image, but they're never central to the image. And one of the reasons that that's the case is because while I'm, I may be perfectly happy opening up every aspect of my life, mm. you may not be. I mean, you know, we, I had the option of photographing this direction and instead I went that direction. Mm. Or we had the option of photographing this direction but, and having an entire image of the audience out there. But what you're seeing is this blank image. Mm. Because it really is about, it's just the facts. It's just the facts. It's not about you know, the relationship between people or the interpretation of what this or that, but it really just comes down to, this is what the FBI wants. If, mm -hmm. they, want, if they want information, I'm willing to provide it. And out yeah. of curiosity, yeah. when you've done, because you've traveled so much since mm -hmm. then, since 2002, yeah. and you've traveled with this project as well, has anyone come up to you and said, actually, I've also been stopped by the FBI? You know, I get those. I get that, uh, but almost always, it's from a previous generation. Almost always it comes from, uh, well, you know, back during the Vietnam era, they suspected me of being a communist, so I had an FBI agent that would knock on my door. And they would, but, but as far as recent uh, people that have been taken in mm. under terrorism related, um, I mean, I hesitate to say charges because they're not really charges. They're just these suspicions. The only other person that I've met in person has been uh, Steve Kurtz, which was the artist and professor in Buffalo, New York, who, whose uh, wife had passed away. Uh, and, and when the coroner came to pick up her body, they saw all this lab. I mean, they're, they're, they're artists, and they were working on an exhibition for genetically modified foods, and they saw this bio lab inside the house. Mm. So of course, he has to be a bioterrorist. Mm. I mean, that's, the, that's, the, that's the logical option that the Buffalo uh, District Attorney's Office took. And unfortunately, I mean, you know, his, her body was confiscated as evidence that he was a terrorist. Mm. His cat was confiscated. It was a horrible situation. Mm. But he's the only other person that I know. Mm. And I don't think it's uh, coincidental that we just both happen to be artists and professors. I think uh, there's a certain level of agency that artists have that we're able to read uh, conditions and situations differently. And I think, I think had I been Hassan the cab driver, not necessarily Hassan the artist and professor, this could have ended very differently. Mm. And I think, so, so what you're really seeing here is not necessarily, you know, when I, when I was going through it, it wasn't, hey, I got material for my next art project, but it was, this may be the reaction that how an artist would react mm. to this type of condition. I think historically artists have always been very good at holding up a mirror to the society around them, whether it, you, know, you go back to the early 1800s, or when you look at Goya paintings, or when you look at the you know, 1940s and abstract expressionism. And it was always this outward of this is what's, so this artist works as a, as a uh, cultural uh, documentar documentarian, historian, and so I think, I think that today it's a, it's a very different world. And mm. I think that's one of the, I mean, you know, if they look sad and desolate and, and just 
stark. I mean, maybe that's the reality of our, that's, that's our political reality today. Are you yeah. still on the FBI's? What was it, the terrorist watch list? Well, I have no idea because, you know, okay. it, for, of course, you know, they, 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 you know, it's like they don't give you a membership club card number. Or anything. <laughs> I wish they would because that would actually work out really nicely. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced maybe, maybe the only list I'm on these days is a spam block list. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, but in all seriousness, uh, until recently, there was, a, there was a million people. There were a million people on the terrorist watch list. I mean, are there really a million terrorists out there? Mm. I mean, that would be pretty scary if there was a million, if there were that many. Uh, so in a lot of ways, you know, we just have this jumbled up data set. Of, and and, and it, it, this, is, this is crucial when you're dealing with large data sets and, you know, what's, what in that data is valuable and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And if you say everything in the data is valuable, well, no, because there can't possibly be a million terrorists. I mean, actually, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a... Uh, uh, politi uh, pop policy and, and security expert, but something tells me that there's not a million terrorists out there, because mm. uh, that would be a absurd number. And do you and have you any yeah. idea whether the FBI or someone within the department has looked at this website, oh, yeah. looks at the images? Yeah, they look at them all the time. Do they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 creepy because you know, like I mean, a lot of us, you know, if you have your websites, you're running Google Analytics or something of that type. So I have I have a kind of a homemade version of that that I'm running on the site. So I wa I'm I'm watching who's watching me. Watch me. <laughs> Does that kind of? It's a kind of a circular logic. Yeah. But I can look through my log files, and all of a sudden, I'll see these like odd three-letter agencies like DOJ.gov, which is Department of Justice, which is what the FBI is under, or I'll say CIA.gov. And these guys don't mask themselves. They just show up mm. as that. A uh, lot, lot, of, lot of sketchy three-letter agencies uh, and, and that are kind of based around Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's a bit of a giveaway. Yeah, mm. and, and, it's, and it's kind of funny because I just re uh, about five years ago, I moved to, in the area, and I work at the University of Maryland now, and if you triangulate the location of the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA headquarters, it ends up smack in the middle of our campus. <laughs> so, you know, we have this budget problem, you know, it's like... Money is tight everywhere, so I figured I'll, I'll help them out by moving close to all of them. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you know, I have, I have to do my civic duty. You know, it's like, it's mm. like you know, we, we, we all need to help, and we all need to do what we, and we know they need all the help they can get. Exactly. So, um, yeah. yeah, any questions from the floor? I guess we're, wow. Have you, as an artist, become an Oh, sorry, yeah, we have a microphone that's going around. Um, if you, yeah. yeah. Have you, as an artist, become kind of trapped by this experience uh, in terms of your response now is based on this experience and a huge yeah. amount of, kind of work gone into it? Sure. But, I mean, can you see that this is kind of working you down the channel here? Yeah, so this project, uh, it's, as this project stands, it's kind of on autopilot. It's something that just happens, and it's. I mean, when I when I enter a building, I'll just photograph it without even thinking about it, and it's it's become a, a direct reaction. And now the data sets, the the database that this is generated, you know, sometimes they're shown as photographs, sometimes they're shown as videos. So that's all taking place. But then there's all these other bodies of work that have come out of since. And interestingly enough, when you look at the work, uh, the the more recent uh, uh, the installation-based works or the sculptural-based works. There's an incredible similarity between those, even visually and conceptually, to works that I was doing 20 years ago. So, in a way, this is this has kind of been the one that gets the curators and the museum folks in through the doors to exp and to say, "Hey, we'd love to show this work." And then, usually, my react usually the thing is, "Well, yeah, this is great, but can I also show you this as well?" Mm -hmm. And try to expand on this. So, so instead of being burdened by this, I kind of look at it as an opportunity, as a door opener. I mean, this is what this is what gets the people. This is this is what people are more are most familiar with, but there's an entire body of work that also exists that that don't necessarily get the same level of attention. So, how many photos do you take a day? It just depends on the day. Uh, today, let me let me look up how many we did today. Today uh, you flew in from Philadelphia. So yeah, this morning. So let's. So see. you didn't you didn't ring anymore. You didn't ring your FBI friend and say well, that, I'm leaving. That stopped a while ago. Did it? But, okay. You know, the, the actual phone calls because now now I mean we have all these things yeah. to go with. So so we have 16, 17. <laughs> we have about 28 since this morning. 28, Which something. actually isn't that much, considering you know it's what so it's six o'clock now. So 
so 18 hours, so one every, you know, 40 <laughs> minutes or so, okay. give or take. And in the beginning, would it have been double that? It depends on the day. If, if I'm moving around a lot, yes. Mm. I mean, today, every, after the airport, I've been basically practically across the street, so there really hasn't been much movement between the two places. But uh, if I'm sitting at home all day, I mean, you might only get one or two images. But if, I, if I'm moving around a lot, you may get up to 100 that day. It just, it just depends on that particular day. Okay. I think, again, because I'm in, I'm in total control over that increment, over that, over that thing. So if you see an image, for example, here, right now, and then 20 minutes later you see an image, say, you know, say 10 minutes away from here, there's only a finite amount of places that I could have possibly been in between. So this is where it goes back to the FBI agent. Mm. But anyway, so going back to, so, so the, photo, the, the photographs have become its own, own world now. So some, sometimes when the work is shown, even though this is how the, the web project is shown, there may be photographs of, for example, every toilet that I've used as a massive print or every meal on the road or, and that's just some of them. And then, and then there's the, the, the sculptural works that go with that. Okay. And then, and then I'm doing these other works, looking at the, the, the new body of work now is looking at the relationship between surveillance and landscape and the watching and, and monitoring. So what we would assume to be, uh, so these things where you actually look through the window, they're, they're video screens, but you don't know whether you're looking at a photograph or, an, or a video. Because when you think about it, uh, w when you think of surveillance camera imagery, what do you think of? You know, you think of these pixely, grainy, gritty images. But when you look at the quality of the pictures that your little phone takes, there's no reason for it to be pixely and grainy. A lot of it is also because our brain rejects the it as surveillance if, if it's hyper aestheticized. So I'm really interested in that relationship between what we read as surveillance and what we don't read. And so what you're basically seeing is an image that would be very similar to a surveillance camera type image, but they're placed in, on walls as if you could see right through the wall. Mm. So that's, that's kind of the, the body of work that I've been working on lately. Cool. Yeah. Hi, uh, okay. thanks. So you have 28 pictures, but do you yeah. spend much time on composition? Do you maybe take 75 and choose 28? Or when you're taking it, are you thinking that's a bit, doesn't, look as good as it could, you know? I, I think one of the things is that I've gotten into this habit of, I mean, I, you know, I've taken so many a day and, and for so many years and just with any other levels of skill sets, I mean, you develop these. And so I kind of know what I'm going to get with the image or I kind of want, I kind of have an idea of it and then it'll, it'll come in. So yeah, no, what you basically, there's very, there's no editing in these. I mean, there's, it's just not possible for me to edit 70,000 images. I mean, it'll actually take me more time than time exists within that time span to edit that. Do you take other pictures as well, or has it come across the guys your ability to take other pictures? There's, there's some of my cat that you'll see every now and then. <laughs> you'll see it on Facebook, but the, the cat never makes it on, on the site. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's certain things that I'll do for, you know, well, family things and that, that that's, there, there are private images, but almost everything is public. Uh, and, and I've decided that, you know, if, uh, I've decided to open up my life to the point where it becomes completely public and open. Uh, but even, in that, even having said that, there is still some level of a barrier. Uh, there is some, and, and I think the way I'm able to do that is by providing so much noise. And I think if I can expand a little bit on that, it's the idea of camouflage. Mm. It's this idea of, you know, when you look at camouflage in the historic sense, uh, you know, we, we have different types of patterns because trees look different everywhere and you want the soldier to blend into the landscape. But if you look at the new camouflage uh, that particularly the U.S. troops are using, mm. it's pixels. It's, it's all pixelated. Mm. It's all inkjet printed. And when you look at the colors, I mean, there's this greenish, grayish color that there's no trees anywhere that look that color. Mm. But what you basically have is a need to blend into the machinery. So the enemy cannot distinguish between okay. the noise and the night vision goggles mm. and the soldier. Mm. So I'm really interested in this idea of camouflage and what that means. And in a way, I'm kind of doing the same thing here. I'm giving you so much information. By the time you've deciphered, is this Im image important or is this data important, that there's all this other stuff happening underneath. Mm. But it's all happening in plain sight as well. Yeah. Has the, um, have you any idea, by the way, what the FBI makes of this? I don't know. No, don't know. no. I've, you know, they're, they're not very good at... They're at, not uh, very no. good at coming back, no. No, they're, they're not cultural critics. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I mean, but you know, but I figured, hey, you know, it's like you got, you guys want information, you, you know, you get it. This is this is what you get. Uh, but yeah. Okay, yeah. Doug, question at the back. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear me. Mm -hmm. Thanks for this. It's very kind of enlightening. You know, I I, I see that there's sort of a, a continuum of, of threads here in your in your visual work, mm -hmm. which. Um, I, I I don't mind. Uh, so, sorry if uh, is it okay if I'm a bit skeptical because oh, sure. I don't see you partaking in any activities. Yeah. Pr pretty much, yeah. other than look, I was eating or sleeping. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, you could easily still be getting away with terrorism, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> So, th so, so, so sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm wondering what kind of conversation, yeah. dialogue you're having with your your, yeah. your 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 consumer here is the FBI, yeah. I guess. Yeah. You know? Your 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 witness or your observer yeah. or whatever. So, mm -hmm. are they are they giving you any kind of anything to go on? Because it seems like you're having a conversation mostly mm -hmm. uh, a very very generic conversation Absolutely, like wallpaper yeah. magazines mm -hmm. Absolutely. you know um, yeah where wh wh what's the dialogue in terms the, the, are you pissing them off is this like a wine <laughs> no thing? no no i'm being helpful right. i'm trying to help them out here but i, don't, I just yeah, don't, i don't see yeah. you know are you, are you do you introduce subplots or anything is there kind of a narrative oh, of any sort there, there there's a lot of interpretation there so for example february 18th and you're looking at this gull uh, a, a, a gas station. Well, that's in Marysville, Washington on Interstate 5, and I was coming back from a trip from Vancouver. Now, that's the narrative, but that narrative is not fully disclosed unless you saw the image before that and the one before that and the one after that. So you have to, so if you think about it, uh, let's, let's step back a little bit and look at, say, uh, film. You know, when you're looking at, when you're looking at film, you're never look, you're actually looking at a moving image. You're looking at a sequence of 24 still images that are moving fast enough where you're where it gives you the illusion of motion. So when you take out one cell out of that frame, you're not going to get the entire narrative. And what I've decided is to very selectively take a cell here, a cell there, a cell there, and a cell. I'm still giving you information, but I'm not giving you the in-betweens. And that's what basically is happening here. So going back to this idea of like, well, in, in, in the practical, pragmatic mode of, of this working as an alibi, it's like, look, I could not have possibly been involved in that terrorist attack because I was sleeping in this hotel room in Las Vegas on this date at this time, because they're all geotagged underneath. So while you may only get the, f the first level of the information, mm. there's an entire data set back there. If you look at your phone, I mean, you could see not only, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the EXIF uh, data, the metadata of your phones, not only you could see where the coordinates of it, you can see which direction, which rotation your phone was, was pointed towards. All that information is in there. So all of these bits and pieces. So, so in a way, as far as why I couldn't possibly be uh, involved in terrorist activities is because there's all these points. So for example, if you're outside and someone, someone says, no, no, you're, you're actually involved in this, but then there's a surveillance camera from across the street that shows you here at this point. Well, you have to be here. There's probably a camera in this room somewhere, but I'm assuming that it's, it's so these cameras that we've historically been very suspicious of and we've been very cautious about accepting, I say, let's forget, let's embrace these cameras. Let's turn it around and embrace it because we can all be in control over that. And I think what it comes down to is this, is this thing of we can turn it into a two-way street rather than a one-way street. And, and I think this is, this is where this, uh, this data flood comes in. It's, it's actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a massive data dump. Uh, on another level, this is actually not that different than what trial lawyers have been doing for, for decades. I mean, here, you want the evidence, here 16,000 pages. You might need three paragraphs somewhere yeah. in the middle. Uh, and I realize this is, a te this is a temporary solution. I mean, we're going to get uh, software that's gonna be much more sophisticated than what it is. We're going to get things that, that will happen and and there will be a way to interpret this. Um, just to give you an idea, there's a, there, 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 I have a body of work, I have a, this one photograph called Hawkeye, which is the internal code name for AT&T, uh, which is our, one of our big phone companies in, in the US. And Hawkeye, it's a data center in San Francisco, or it's one of their data centers, and it contains every phone conversation on AT&T's network since 9-11. It's not, I mean, how do, you, how do you go through every single phone call? It's something like, in, back in 2007, I think its size was like 300 terabytes. 
how do you go through that much data? You don't. It's not meant for human consumption. It's meant for machine consumption. It's meant for machine reading. So all the photographs that we're taking, it's not necessarily for us to see. It's for machines to see the data that's behind the, that. And I think this is a lot of what's happening in the life logging exhibition here. A lot of the data that we're creating, even though we look at it as data and we interpret them or we internalize them and we kind of editorialize them on a personal basis, a lot of the information underneath is being generated for other machines. Hmm. And I think we need to be kind of careful about that as more and more and more of our lives are quantified out there. Sorry, question here in the front. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, you were talking about, you know, it being safer if you're, you know, putting everything out there or mm -hmm. even everything out there with it, you know, certain limitations. Yeah. And the sort of two things that kind of have an argument against that, and maybe you've got a response for, mm -hmm. is one, what about pairings? So yes. them taking your phone yeah. and pairing that data with this data. Absolutely. Um, or, or someone else's mm -hmm. data with your data. Yeah. Um, you know, because you're talking about, you know, protecting other people's. Yeah. And the other thing would be about, it, you know, this is all fine until it's something to do with in retrospect. Yes. So say some dictator comes in, mm -hmm. takes over, and Ireland is now enemy of the States and you happen yeah. to have been visiting and that's now documented. Um, exactly. You know, is, is it actually accounting for, you know, cha changes in our world, changes in modern society, 10 years down the line, mm -hmm. this all may actually be incriminating? Well, I think that's one side of it. And I think the other side of it is when you have gaps in the, in, in, when you go off grid. I think that, that, that raises more suspicions. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of like when you, when you send someone an SMS when they don't respond, well, why are you not responding? Mm -hmm. It's, wh why are you not answering my phone? Mm -hmm. what's, what's going on? I mean, that's on a personal basis, but what does that do to an entire society where you can't go off grid? And if you go off grid, then it must be grounds for suspicion. Mm -hmm. So I think in a sense, it's, we're seeing a change of this. And, and, and again, I, 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 don't, I don't believe that disconnecting is an option. I think, I think engaging it further and, and taking control over it I think is, is, a, is a much more uh, different direction. I think one of the things we were talking about, this idea of externalized memory earlier. So what happens to, what happens to the fact that we no longer have a need to delete? And what is, that means we no longer have a need to forget. So what happens to an entire society that no longer has to forget anything? Except we've forgotten everything that's just there on our phones. But, it's, but it can be triggered at any given moment. Mm. And I mean, you know, it's like as, as humans, I mean, we've had what, hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years of understanding mourning. If that's a permanent state, I mean, what does that do to us? Uh, so there's, I think there's different, there, it, we're, we're coming up against some very, very tough challenges and, and very tough societal challenges of what we used to think of as norm and what's becoming norm. And, and the technology is moving so fast, so, so, um, it's, it's at such a speed that culturally, you know, we do our best to keep up, but, but we're changing as well. Did you ever wear the Google glasses, by the way? No, I haven't. I haven't. Would but that you know, not make your job easier? It might be, but you know, but it's, okay, so I'll tell you one thing. So a long time ago, I used to wear uh, one of those uh, old Nokias around my neck, <laughs> and it would just photograph on a right, and I hated those photos. I mean, it just, I just couldn't get, I couldn't, I, you know, going back to the aesthetics of the images, I was just like, I can't deal with this. this why does this image look like this? So I stopped doing that, and then I started actually taking the photo, and then being very deliberate about what the image looked like rather than getting the incidental image. A friend of mine, uh, Wafa Bilal, he implanted a camera in the back of his head and it would just photograph every minute. And uh, his images look very different. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say they do. We have yeah. a question in the middle here, yeah. yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering, oh gosh, I was just wondering, um, it's influenced your art a lot, this yeah. experience, this interaction with the government, yeah. but how has it influenced your politics? How has it influenced how you feel about having been in the dark corners of US politics and US government, how they interact with citizens and their yeah. own people at the mm -hmm. end of the day. So yeah. how has it influenced your politics and how you feel about how it's run and governed? It's scary. It's scary. Um, I think one of the things is having gone through the process, um, I can tell you that, I mean, you know, I don't have any proof on this, but I'm quite certain there are people that are locked up somewhere and their only crime is that they didn't necessarily understand the question. So for example, one of the questions they asked me at the, uh, 
during the investigation was, um, let me try to remember this, have you ever witnessed or participated in any act that may be detrimental to the United States or a foreign nation? Think of the condition that you're in being asked this question. And, and then, you know, so the other guy's asking like, you know, like goofy questions like state, you know, like what were you doing there? And then all of a sudden like a question like that comes out of nowhere. And if you don't pick up on the fact that you've been asked four questions and the answer is any of the above, it can end up pretty horribly. So I think in, in, in my read of the politics of it, I think at the end of the day, it's so easy to incriminate anyone that if you really want to and you really have to work. So this, this, this idea of innocent until proven guilty almost reverses and you have to prove innocence. So that is something that scares me. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something that, that's, that I've seen from the inside. The other thing also is the, is that you know, there's, there's incredibly intelligent people there. There's incredibly sophisticated machinery and software. It's a cultural problem. It's a cultural problem where this organization won't talk to this organization and that this organization won't talk to that organization. They're trying to get better at it, but it's still, I mean, even today, I mean, we have data, we, we have information, but they won't talk. So, and again, that's, that's not something that's going to be changed by, uh, that's not gonna, something that's going to change overnight. And that's something that I feel very, very disturbed about pol politically. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're kind of like a poster boy for explaining that. You mm -hmm. can be like, listen, this has happened to me yeah. and it sucked and yeah. this is because of this and that. And do you feel like you would ever get involved in something like that where yeah. you would, I know that this is partly, like it yeah. is what it is, but um, specific to US politics, mm -hmm. like get involved in politics sure. kind of to explain how the faults of the system have not yeah. really been helping the situation. Well, or do they ever apologize? No, no, mm -hmm. no, they're, they're, they're not, again, they're not in that business. Mm -hmm. they're, it's only a one way thing with them. <laughs> but uh, I've had uh, conversations with some relatively high folks in, in government about this. And the fact that I can actually you know, have that conversation with them, I think, I think says something about being able to access certain, some of these people. And I think it's important to have, and to, to have that conversation take place on a, on a direct one-to-one. -one. I mean, you know, there was one, one co uh, conference that I did recently where <laughs> there was a guy from formerly of the Department of Justice who had invited me. And we had a three hour long breakfast conversation about, hey, what does this mean or what's that mean? You know, it's, it, and he's just like, wait, 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 they, they told you this? <laughs> you know, it's, it's to really see it from the inside, I have a completely different appreciation for it. But again, I think a lot of it, we're in a, we're in a bizarre transition. I mean, as we go through this analog to digital, I think we're also seeing a parallel cultural transition from, you know, for all practical purposes, our, our, our intelligence systems in the US is still stuck on the Cold War. It's still in a Cold War model and, and we're slowly shifting, slowly shifting over. And I'm glad it's happening. I'm really glad that's happening because you know, what happened before doesn't necessarily apply today. And the system doesn't apply. But you can't, you know, just because you have a new president doesn't mean you can change every single FBI agent. That's just not practical. I mean, you can't do that. So that's going to have a specific lifespan that's going to shift. So anyway, so that's a little bit on that. Okay, another question there in the middle. Um, just to go back to what you were saying about going off the grid, raising yeah. suspicion. I mean, do you intend to do this for the rest of your life? Um, I think, and if you stop, yeah. you know, how do you think that might be interpreted? You know, I think all of us are doing this already. Uh, you know, this is not something. I don't, I don't think. I don't think. I don't think I'm actually going to ever stop this because whether I stop this or not, my phone does it for me anyway. By the way, how many folks have you on iPhones? Are you on iPhones here? Okay, do this. Do this thing. And some of you may already uh, shut this off, but let's 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 creep some people out. <laughs> so, so go to your system settings. Do you folks know about this? Your frequent locations? Yeah. Okay, so, but for those that don't know this, go to your system settings and then go down to uh, privacy. Go to location services. You got that? And then go all the way down to system services. And then towards the bottom, you'll see frequent locations. Go to frequent locations and tell me if you're not a little weirded out. <laughs> I see a lot of head shaking out there. Yeah, it tells you exactly when you showed up, what, how long you were there, and what you were doing. 
So these days, it makes no sense to have uh, you know, uh, an FBI agent follow you around when they can just go to Apple and get the data from you directly. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, this is where that, so even if you choose to go off grid, you're still on grid. Do you think you get a call saying, hey, why did you stop? I'm sorry, what's that? Do you think your FBI guy might call you up and say, you know, why did you stop showing this video? Hmm. No, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Because the thing is, there would still be other ones. And I think, you know, so in a way, I, I don't think it's a matter of like, this is some, I'm just some odd person doing this. I think maybe 12 years ago, this, I was that, you know, weird artist doing this. But I think now so many of us are doing this. Whether we know it or not, whether we're aware that we're generating these databases or not, I think that's where it gets really, really tricky. The fact that we're all on grid. I mean, you know, how does your credit card company know to call you on a fraud charge? Because it mm -hmm. says, you know, if it sees your charges mm -hmm. around this area and all of a sudden it gets a ping from over there, mm -hmm. wait, 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 this doesn't look like, the, this person doesn't shop at a, at, a, at a pet food store. I mean, yeah, these, these, this is, there's all these data sets that are being combined together. So I think the off-grid part, you know, I think it's a romantic idea of going off-grid, but I don't think it's technologically or, or even socially possible today. Have any other artists, by the way, decided to do the same? I think there's a, there's a lot of folks that are that are doing similar yeah. similar things. I mean, I guess this entire exhibition that you have here, uh, I think there's quite a mm. few folks over there that are documenting, and uh, but for very different reasons. Yeah. And actually, this is something that many artists have been doing for decades ago. Uh, I mean, on Kawara, for example, I love those things. I mean, you know, he just painted those dates, so it's say like July 10th, 1968. But on the back of them were like newspaper clippings from that date. Or things, and, and or when you look at uh, you know the burned-in Hillebeckers, the the photographs of every single blast furnace, or photographs of every water tower. I mean, so so this is something. In a lot of ways, I mean, and, you know, you see this you see this map of me moving around in this arrow. I mean, that's actually not that different than what Vito Acconci was doing 40 years ago, where he was mapping his body through a city. Mm -hmm. So instead of literally mapping his body through a city. Now you're seeing a data body being mapped through a data city. I mean, you know, you, you remember that, you know, it's a, the old maps that we used to have, road maps, where you'd actually like open it up <laughs> and you'd have to go, I'm here. Where you'd have to place yourself to the geography. And now you pull out that magic phone and you hit that button and you become the center of your map. I mean, there's a huge shift. I think there's a huge cultural shift about that, where we all have our own personal maps. So I think, yeah, so I think yeah. in a lot of art, a lot of other artists, I mean, this is, I don't think this is a, something terribly new. I think this, the form may be new, but I think uh, this is something that's been around for decades, if not centuries. Okay, mm -hmm. I think we've time for one more question there in the middle, yeah. Uh, not anymore now. now. Now I'm all set up. Now I have... Uh, you know, global entry things and, uh, you know, known numbers and, and CBP things, which is kind of ironic because, you know, I've, it's, so they've checked me out. It's because recently the problem was never like, oh, here's this. It's always, you know, you go to the person and the person's like, yeah, you're okay, but let me make sure. So I'm going to pass you on to the next guy and the next guy is like, yeah, you're okay, but let me make sure. But the, of course they don't tell you you're okay. So now I come in, I stick my passport in a machine, I stick my fingers in, it takes a picture, out comes a piece of paper. And I walk out, and the guy says, machine says you're okay, you're okay. Mm. So it's kind of like that. So anyway, do we have another one in the middle? Just a little bit yeah. quick. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I just change? Yeah, no. Um, oh. how, how do we even know that that happened to you in the airport with the FBI? I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, an artwork is only as good as the story behind yeah. it. Yeah. And maybe you just came up with the story to make this life logging thing interesting. It, like you say, it's been done now. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I'm, I not, wish I'm not trying to trivialize yeah, it, no, but no, there's no, an element yeah. of trust between yes. us, the viewer, Absolutely. and you, the author. Absolutely. And you yeah. talk about disclosure of narratives, but yeah. 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 You know. I, I wish I didn't have to go through that. Uh, would I go through it all over again? Hell no. No way. Absolutely not. You, you uh, were never tempted to kind of try and get re... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> re no. Because, there, because the stakes are too high. I mean, there's just... There, I mean, uh, you know, it, the last thing on my mind when this was happening was art. And it was really, how do I get out of this situation? Mm -hmm. And it was really that trigger point. Uh, now, having said this, uh, there are many journalists over the years that have been trying to contact the FBI and said, hey, we'd like to do it. And they're basically, we don't comment on this. We don't yeah. comment. Uh, so that's been going on for I don't know how long. Now, but the interesting thing is, a few years ago, I was commissioned to do a, uh, a public art project inside of an airport. And you have to remember, I've been trying for years trying to get uh, the FBI to tell me I'm okay. I, I, I wanted some document, and they said, we don't, we don't provide these. 
But uh, in order for me to be paid by this airport for this project, I had to be employed by the airport. And you can imagine the complications of being employed by the airport having this Homeland Security uh, passed. So the person that handles all the clearances at the airport, uh, she said, well, I, we know you're going to be difficult, so we're going to send yours separate from all the other artists. And this is, this is the person that handles all of them at the airport. She said, hey, so she calls me back uh, a, a little bit later, and she says, your paperwork came back. It looks exactly like everybody else's. There's nothing that's any different, except the FBI called me this morning, and they want to meet with me about you. <laughs> so somewhere there's still a shadow database that's being flagged somewhere. Hmm. So we don't know why. Again, it's, it's these multiple uh, levels of these databases. And when this data gets muddled up together, that's, that's basically what, you know, when, when I get screwed up, so uh, this thing about getting in and out of Canada, uh, well, it wasn't necessarily Canada, but in 2005 when Homeland Security was restructured, prior to 2005, each of the organizations kind of maintained their own databases. But in 2005, it all got muddled up. And even something that was cleared up by these folks got re-triggered. And ever since 2005 to 2008 was really difficult. And then after 2008, it kind of cleared up again. Mm. Uh, and, then, and then in 2011 is when I got this whole thing with all these clearances and such, where then it's basically just, you know, I don't even deal with the human being anymore, which is actually kind of nice. I like that. I, I love those speed cameras. You know, I might be the only one that says that. It's because it, it, takes, it takes the discretion out of the policeman. It's, you know, it's purely a yes, no. It's a, it's, it's a binary. It's not kind of like, well, you can't I'll say, I guard that go like on, let me off this yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I kind of like that. But anyway, we so, like that. We like yeah. that. So, so going back to the machine, I, I like the machine. I like, I like this like yes, no of the, of the binary that works. Yeah. So if people want to, want to find out what you're doing later tonight, uh, right the here. website, yeah? The website, I assume, is just hassanalahi.com. It's it? trackingtransients.net. Oh. Talk but you can get to it from there, yes. Uh, so, so there's like my other body of work on, uh, on ilahi.org or hassanilahi.com. There's a whole bunch of sites that redirect the same place. But that has the other body of work, so if you're interested in what, the, what life outside of this project looks like. Hassan Alahi, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.